Okay, so Carl, you you have a question about basically we could say the discernment of being able to see beyond just the mere gratification that we receive from the various things that we do into the uh, the dukkha that not is against some rules but actually is unwholesome actually is unsatisfying and unsatisfactory or at least the danger of that occurring okay so this is something that is talked about in the suttas quite a lot about that we get gratification from all kinds of places for all kinds of reasons and then we begin to see the danger in those things and when we can see the danger then we would rather then balance the the appreciation or let us say a cost benefit analysis on that as as a business would and if you come to the conclusion that right now that's not a good idea to do that then you say no to it and put it down and don't take that business deal because the dangers outweigh the benefits. The cost is too high for the benefit that I used to think was going to always be free without any cost. Now I'm beginning to see the cost in things. And that's the wisdom. And as you progress, you'll progress in being able to weigh that stuff out more and more and more often to wake up and to take a look at what you're doing and to assess it in this system of cost benefit analysis so that you wind up always being a winner. You either don't take the deal or you really enjoy the heck out of the benefits of it. Your choice. If we can be awake to be wise that much of the time, that often we will wind up making a lot of wise decisions for our lives because we're constantly weighing the cost benefit of whether it's worth having that kind of thought or that kind of outlook. And so we begin to take on more power, more, um, let us say, wholesome outlooks for things. But in that, uh, that wholesome outlook, it also looks fortunate, lucky, and that you begin to, uh, to rise above all of that stuff that used to be very dangerous for you because you're not participating in that kind of stuff anymore out of your own wisdom, out of beyond being able to look at what you're doing, see it, make that uh, weighing of it, and then choose wisely which way to go. And so we could say that that's actually what, I mean, anybody would say, well, that's a pretty good idea for most things, right? Well, we're saying, oh no, we're going to nitpick that to death. We're going to start making that a major habit in life to start to wake up and look moment by moment by moment as best we can so that we can make a decision upon is this thought wholesome or is this thought unwholesome? And if it's unwholesome, we're going to kick it out. We're going to begin to see the dangers more and more and more minutely. And this is the kind of wisdom that grows through this investigation. If you're willing to take the effort to make the change, once you make that determination is yes, this is much more wholesome to do than that. So let me take the effort to throw that out. Because there's a lot of old bad habits in there that you've gotten. Everybody has a bunch of bad habits, but we don't recognize them as bad habits because we haven't investigated them in this way of making this cost-benefit analysis to figure out whether it's just merely to our advantage and we like it and we get benefit from it and it costs us nothing. Or I like it and I got to do it. I don't care how much it costs. And so we begin to settle that bargain inside. And when, when we do, we wind up acting wisely much of the time. Go ahead. So the the opposite of that would be ignorance because you have to be wake up why you have to have wisdom in the particular moment of seeing the contact of the thing. 
the opposite would be choosing ignorance and saying, yeah, I don't care how much it costs, I'm still going to do it. But I don't know, I, I, the rest of the things, I can see this danger developed over time. Like it, it becomes skilled with certain things, but with certain things, it doesn't feel like there's a development of a skill looking towards them, or is it just a deeper ingrained habit of it? I don't know if that makes sense. It feels like it's a bit more clinging to it. Like there's some things we cling more than others. Oh, absolutely. That's the whole point is, is that when the uh, clinging is heavy duty, we don't recognize the cost of the struggle. Many, many times kids are playing together, struggling with each other, and one of them finally says, hey, this is too much work, and they just let go. Okay, so that's the whole point of the clinging. Yes, the clinging is what benefit am I getting out of this? And when we only see the advantage and we don't see the disadvantage, then we're not acting wisely. We're acting out of greed. We're acting ignorantly. But when we act wisely, that means that we wake up and we take a look and we make an evaluation about which is, the, in fact, the cost of this. Then we can begin to plan our escape. This is a very simple thing, and the Buddha talks about it quite often. Is to be able to remember to make this cost benefit analysis. The gratification versus the danger, and then the escape is the way he phrased it. We can see the danger in it, and it doesn't matter what the gratification was. The danger outweighs that, and so we'll find an escape. So as long as we're clinging, that's here's an example of that is someone who was smoking. <laughs> and <clears throat> he knows that it's harmful and he wants to stay healthy, but he still is smoking. All right. So that means that he can see the danger, but he only sees it intellectually. Some people will in fact get really, really sick and then go to the doctor and the doctor tells them they got to quit smoking, they will. Other people on their deathbed will sneak a drag as they die. They never got the point about how dangerous it is. And the final drag killed them. So the question is, in fact, this is um, there's a concept about it that's used quite often, especially in places like AA, in the sense of hitting rock bottom. That the time that you know that someone's going to come out of alcoholism is when he crash lands. He's hit rock bottom. Now the whole idea is that I don't know really what bottom is, but I knew I know what crash landing is, and you can crash land into the trees. You don't have to hit bottom to crash. There's a whole lot of crashing going on without people even going even further than that. And there seems to be no end to it so long as there's no end to the ignorance and the greed. But when we begin to take a look and begin to see, that means that we now, uh, we hit a hard landing, but it's not a, a crash. Because we begin to wake up and slow down before we hit things. So that and part of the reason that we're doing that is because we're beginning to weigh things out. We're beginning to look at is this harmful or what? In other words, we're beginning to use the discerning mind or the frontal cortex. We're beginning to use the best part of the human brain as opposed to I like it, therefore I want it, which is more the animal or the reptilian brain in the anterior cortex. So we have to wake up and to be here now, to wake up and look at what's going on in the mind right here, right now, to figure out is, is this wise or not? Because you might be planning on doing something that would turn out to be really ridiculously bad idea of doing, and you could see that in advance if you'd merely looked at it rather than acting upon impulse or instinct. I see this with, um, as far as like 
the only time there's a strong clinging when you uh, ignore the thoughts and you go down the rabbit hole, like you ignore the anxiety. So anxiety builds up and then the, the habit justifies itself because, hey, I'm feeling so anxious. Look how much anxiety I felt throughout the day. I really, really need this. I really, really need this right now. So anxiety tries to justify itself if you allow it to build up. That's what I'm saying, more of danger of each moment. Yes, in fact, look how far that anxiety had driven you that time so that tomorrow you'll wake up to, hey, maybe I should deal with this anxiety without doing that. Because doing that is really dangerous, but I did that because I was driven by the anxiety. So then, in fact, the whole issue of anxiety is, is that people have been taught in our society to deal with that kind of stuff in a secondary way. In other words, you can't go directly after dealing with the anxiety. You've got to cause uh, whatever the anxiety uh, was caused by. You've got to deal with that. So if I want a car and I feel great anxiety because I have to hoof it to work or something like that, and I really want and need that car, I think that getting the car is going to make me free from anxiety. But in fact, no, the anxiety is already being built up as a habit or as an attitude or kind of a life view in a way. And so, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying right now, sorry, I see the anxiety has been built up to drive me to do these things. It's been built up actually just to do them. It, it's, it doesn't appear and then I have to do it. It actually drives me to do them. It is there because I'm doing those things. It's, it's mm -hmm. creating the problem and solving as this. <laughs> well, congratulations, you're waking up. That's the whole point. Now we can begin to see that the anxiety itself is dangerous. Because look what it drove you to. And so if we can see that the, the, the anxiety itself is dangerous, then maybe we can begin to weigh up how we got that anxiety in the first place and start figuring out, is that stuff worthy of, if I do that, I'll wind up in anxiety. And so that's where we start to deal with it at the thought level, because we generally talk ourselves into feeling anxious. Because of the, uh, the conceptualized thoughts that we have about how dangerous it is way out there or how bad things are getting. Or, oh, there's inflation or, you know, any kind of depressed kind of thinking that we have will make us feel that way. And so it's better to have an upbeat, happy, uh, 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 gladdening, bright uh, way of talking to yourself about yourself. And the only way that we can really do that easily is by having that as an attitude, the attitude of a winner, a happy winner. But everything is going my way. Uh, so when you've developed the attitude that everything is going your way, then where's the anxiety going to come from? It'd be, you'll be free from the anxiety because you've already got the attitude that everything is going your way. It's just how you planned it. You couldn't have things work out any better than this. Wow, what a nice life this is. <sighs> Now that's a wholesome attitude. Your choice. That's an attitude that's completely free from anxiety. Because anything that you can think about of, of something going bad, you can say, yeah, but I can take care of that when it happens. I've got things pretty well planned out. I almost see like as you're driving a car and 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 you get you get unsatisfied with how the your drive is going and you're saying hey anxiety take this over for a bit I'm gonna go take a break hey anger take this take the wheel over I'm gonna take a break but you can almost you have to have an attitude of a winner saying hey I can win this race by myself I don't have to have uh, anxiety to jump in to satisfy me in this moment I can win this race by myself as slow as I drive as as fast as I go I can win it. Yeah, it's right. A, I don't even have, 
that um, I'm not even sure where this comes from, but it's of uh, Sati as the as the driver or holding the reins. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for the remembering. Exactly, that's in Sutta. That let the Sati be your guide. Okay, let your, that waking up to be here now so that we can and do that investigation, that evaluation, that uh, weighing things out, that cost benefit analysis, many different ways to say it. And it's the attitude of, I'm going to win this one. That's the attitude. You're comfortable and competent, and you can handle anything. And mostly that gives you the actual idea then that you don't compete with other people anymore because you automatically know that you're going to win because that's the attitude that you took in the first place. And then we begin to realize that all the competitions that we ever had, we set the criteria in advance to win or lose. That we all live in our own world anyway. And so if you're going to compete, then why not compete in a way that you know absolutely without a doubt that you're going to win or you don't play? After you get that attitude that every time you're going to win, then you get up the idea of, well, wait a minute, why am I even bothering to play the game anyway? Because I'm going to win every time. So why play, why play the game? And so that's when we come out of competition altogether. It's with that recognition that even competition is dangerous. Because look how much work it takes. But you needed that exercise in order to come to that conclusion. Because so long as there's winning and losing, so we're addicted to gambling in a way. Yes or no, and up and down and back and forth and win and lose. And we're addicted to that. So you got to stage it first to make sure that you're going to have your life set up so that you're a dead ringer winner. And that's the attitude that you have, and then you can drop your competition. Hang on a second. Okay. All right. And how we can get there is by being that winner time after time after time so that we can actually talk ourselves into it because I can't talk you into being a winner. That you're going to have to do yourself and the only way you can talk yourself into being a winner is by doing a whole series of wins one after another after another until you get really good at being a winner. This in the Pali is the Sama Sankapa. That's the good feeling that, hey, I can win this one. I've got this one wired. Can't touch me. How do we do that? By beginning to watch the thoughts that we have, especially the thoughts that are thoughts of being a loser. You say, eh, I don't need that thought. I can do better than that. And so we throw that unwholesome thought out and bring in a new wholesome thought, one after another after another, until we have a whole long line of series of wholesome thoughts. We get into the habit of it. We get into the rhythm of it. And then it begins to get the attitude. And that rhythm is, in fact, having several components. One of them is the actual feeling of safety and security. And another one is of being comfortable. But whoever it is that comes up, whatever they want, I'm going to stay secure and comfortable no matter what happens. Doesn't matter what this guy's uniform is or how big his gun is or what kind of badges he has, I can handle him. So. If we have the attitude, then that you can handle whatever happens. Then. That attitude is going to only come from a repetition. Of that over and over and over again. This is what 
we actually are talking about is the skill of sati, the skill of waking up, taking a look, taking control of and start to drive that vehicle that is your life. That's sati. Wakey, wakey. Because only when you're awake can you decide which to go. Do you take your horses and chariot that way or this way? Your choice once you're watching what's going on. So you have to become the driver of your own life. And, and the discernment then is wholesome or unwholesome. In other words, don't drive your rig in a ditch. <laughs> But there's a lot of ditches out there. And so we have to be quite on our feet or quite on our toes or quite on our tip of watching what we're going, watching where we're doing. But the better you get at it, then the higher the speed you're capable of, of going. Because you take off when you start to fly. And they say that angels can fly because they take themselves so lightly. And that starts with having one wholesome thought after another to get rid of all the heavy thoughts, things, things that weigh us down. Evaluate that, make sure that you understand there's dangers in having heavy thoughts. Which it keeps you from flying. So, what do you think, Carl? I don't think much, to be honest. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I see it. I see it. Um, yeah, I, the the winner attitude is quite an important component of, of it all. I I, I I came to test that this week for sure. Um, it, 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 the winner attitude is, is really something else. Like. Uh, uh, I do martial arts and I went and I got injured again. And I was like, there's two two choices. You can self-love or you can leave as a winner and be like, oh, hey, I'm not going to have to work. I'm finding some things I'm winning at. I'm, 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 I'm not going to have to create rules to go to work. I can take a rest. I can relax. And that kind of helps you move through it, move through these things and take them more lightly. Mm -hmm. And that's great. So do you it, did we finish the question or do you have sub questions about it? It's it's very clear. <laughs> <laughs> clear as the sky. Yes, this is the practice of Anapanasati. This is actually the 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 teaching of the Buddha and it is so simple. But it has gotten lost in ritual and in uh, conjecture and for Western Buddhism, this got lost in translation. But Buddhism is much more alive and well in Thailand than it is in the West, but still is only in pockets in Thailand. That there's a vast sea of ignorance out there, but the ignorance of the Thai people seems to be at least more wholesome than Western style read about everything. That in fact, uh, part of the problem is, is that we have been taught in the Western culture that we do get our gratification from material possessions, labor saving devices, and uh, security systems and cell phones and transportation and all kinds of things that exist, especially now in the past, say, 30 to 50 years, that none of that stuff existed back before then. And humanity was kind of okay, but they weren't slaves to these devices. They were slaves to whatever devices they had. 
and on it goes back into history and the slaving to the devices and the material possessions is the delusion that I can get my pleasure and security and feelings of safety and comfort from these devices. This couch will make me feel comfortable or this chair or this I was going to talk about chairs. <laughs> you know how how in how in Asia they just sit on the floor all together, have meals on the floor. Um, even the elderly might sit on the floor. Um, whereas in the West, you know, you get put in a high chair, <laughs> basically like a throne from a, from a as an infant. We give ourselves a capital I, spell our names with a capital letter. Um, it's quite funny. <laughs> In a way, there is script, but there is no upper and lower case in the Thai language like there is in English. So there is no way of capitalizing other than making a flourish of, of ink or something. And then that will be just thought of as some other letter. <laughs> um, so yes, that whole idea then of furniture making someone comfortable and so how much how many chairs and sofas and recliners and big equipment do they sell in the west under the guise of that i can be comfortable finally if i only bought that lazy susan or lazy boy or whatever and so uh marcus is right in thailand uh the furniture industry is nothing in Thailand like it is in the West. And often this furniture that is sold is quite, um, let us say, traditional. Either traditional in hard wood or it's in traditional in bamboo. But there's still an awful lot of bamboo that's still sold because that's the traditional kind of stuff. Which is actually quite cheap compared to <laughs> big expensive furniture. So the whole idea then is, is that we can only get comfortable by buying something. It is very strong in Western mentality. Or I can only be safe by buying something like a weapon. In Thailand, um, it's been, let us say, unnecessary to but now easily to regulate weapons so that uh not even all the police have a have a weapon even when a police gets it he's got to do quite a lot of work including getting his peers to um say that it's okay and so in the population of people who have guns normally they're in the uh family of the police like the wife will have a gun and the daughter will have a gun and that kind of thing. So it's a very highly stylized set of circumstances in Thailand for people to have a weapon. And yet in the West, weapons are very, very, very um, common because of the idea, the mentality that a weapon will make us safe and secure. And yet weapons or one thing that is quite dangerous. <laughs> I mean, how, how can you see it otherwise? That there's a cost-benefit analysis here. If you're, you're, the gratification is to have the safety from the gun. But the danger is, is that the gun itself is more dangerous than not having it around. So when we begin to see things from a different perspective, that we can actually go and find that safety security, that sense of well-being, that sense of comfort directly by practicing it and gaining that feeling directly over and over and over again, we begin to feel safe and secure and comfortable without much in the way of material possessions. So we begin to evaluate all the material possessions that we have with the idea that I can live easily, comfortably, happily with less. And when we begin to look at that we can live 
uh, comfortably with a whole lot less, then we can begin to recognize, well, I don't have to work so hard if I don't need so much. Then I can begin to see that I don't have to work much at all if I don't want much at all. And that's when the real laziness of the teaching of the Buddha lays in. To go find an easy life. So, one one sorry one thing I noticed I, I I lived in Thailand as well for a year living the Thai boxer's dream for a year and I noticed with like uh, the coaches they always as you said there's a lightness in Thais because they say always say sabai sabai relax be calm but you see these foreigners come up so tense and they always trying to prove their point like like it's almost like they have to turn themselves into a weapon. They have to be dangerous. They have to be very heavy. They have to be like these heavy emotions. So I can see how like Buddhism in Western countries, people go to Thailand and they might get a glimpse or a flavor of that. And then they come back to the Western side and they get sit down on a cushion, stay, stay hard, stay still, don't move. And that's the Buddhism here. And then you jump from this to that, and you're looking for a, for different religions. You're looking for different ways out of this kind of way because it, it's never light. It's it's never light over here. It's always hard, heavy, slow. It it does it doesn't feel the same lightness as I felt in Thailand. It certainly does not even with people. Yeah. Okay. But you can still have that feeling of lightness on your own inside because you know it, you can see it, you can see that a whole culture can have it. And so even though you're in the Western culture, you don't have to be other. You can be more noble than that. You can rise above that whole uh, mentality. Hello, Robert, welcome on. So, yes, it, there is a, um, a change in the whole culture of Thailand that many, many Westerners don't have a clue about. But in fact, sometimes it takes quite a while for people to figure out that the, the Thai people have a completely different attitude about things. And many of the, the Thais um, are, are also being caught up in the Western mentality too, that there's kind of an inter reaction there. Um, that uh, mental viruses are infections on both ends. So if you've got a virus and I've got a virus, when we come together, we can actually get, make each other sicker by giving us each two viruses. Unless you can come around to those who are noble. Or like Thailand, for instance, does not have that virus of uh, everything's got to be hard. But they've got families to rely upon. That, um, uh, gosh, many examples of it. But one example would be that if, um, let us say, the Western culture is like from McDonald's, and McDonald's says, no, here's your shift, and you've got to do that. And the gal says, well, I've got to go up country because my family is having a, a wedding or something. And he says, you can't go. She will go anyway, not expecting to lose her job. And if she does lose her job, she's going to reply right back to the same job and probably get it back in Thailand. Marcus, you're smiling. You know that this is true. <laughs> and in the West, once you're out of here, you're if you do, if you go and I tell you not to go and you go anyway and I'm going to fire you and you're fired and you don't come back. Right, and that's the threat that the boss has more power than the employee. But in a more of egalitarian culture, no, that boss is just that boss of that place. But I don't have to stay under him. I can just move right off, go back to my family, 
and and Bangkok is a big, wide, wonderful city, and there's all kinds of employment, and I can find a job again, and my family will support me until I do. In fact, most of the founding families in of country <laughs> have an apartment in Bangkok that sometimes gets really, really crowded, and sometimes it's empty depending upon the, the family's use of that. And some people will move to Bangkok and live in that apartment with other cousins and relatives or whatnot, and, and then support themselves while they're looking and finding a job in Bangkok. And so uh, because they have that safety net, they've got a really huge family oriented safety net, and I'm really impressed by it, even after all these years. In fact, the more I'm in the Thai culture, the better I understand it. And so uh, there's a lot of fondness for that because it goes in the direction of everything's okay and everything's fine, just relax, dry in, settle down, cool off, no place to go, no, no worries, no hurries, no flurries. That's very wholesome Asian attitude that takes us right into our own coolness within the bomb. And so that's why it's so much easier for Arahats to arise in Thailand is because half the job is built right into the culture. But you can still develop that in the West by remembering every thought that comes up that takes you back into that culture of it's hard work, I don't like this, we got to fix that things of, of the world, if you can catch that thought and say, nope, I'm out of here. Let us take the easy way out. Time after time after time, and we develop that as an attitude over time. The attitude, I got this wired. The attitude of the winner. The Buddha was called a lion. So have the lion's attitude. So does anybody have any questions? Marcus. <laughs> I, uh, I would have a question. Yes. Um, yeah, so uh, lately I've been, um, I had more time to, to sit down and meditate or lie down and I'm, I'm really happy with, with my practice at the moment, like very regular and all that. And I get to a point where there's a lot of uh, wholesome thoughts. I feel really well. I can sit for a long time and I'm, I'm very comfortable. And uh, the mind kind of stills. And uh, lately I find that um, this is very interesting for a while. And then at some point I kind of start to get bored. And now I was kind of trying to focus my attention now on, on the boredom itself and kind of trying to understand why I'm getting bored with this pleasant sensation um, that I was so fascinated before. And I just wanted, yeah, I just wanted to put that out there and uh, see Cool. Uh, what the response is there, what's happening. And, uh... Oh, it's very characteristic. Yes, there's all kinds of ways to get bored. I remember, in fact, one time staying in the back of the watch day after day with, I think the only literature I had was an old motorcycle magazine that had been read a dozen times. Nothing left at all. <laughs> And and boredom did set in. Um, it is sort of like very pe very few people, even when they say that they get hungry and they get hungry from time to time, maybe day after day, they get hungry day every day. But that's nothing like getting really hungry because you haven't had anything for such a long time. Okay, well that was the state that I had gotten in that I was really, really hungry. I was bored. I was hungry for input. And then it dawned on me that the reason that I, that was happening was because I wasn't paying attention to what was happening. 
but there was a huge amount of stuff happening. And I was in a forest. And I tried to ignore what was going on around me, which is exactly what the, the problem with uh, Western mindset is, is that what is happening is not good enough rather than beginning to appreciate. And so th that was a major turnaround for me to recognize, oh, yes, the reason that I'm bored is because I'm not practicing correctly. But yeah, the hardcore meditation was still with me, but that was not because that's what happens. We get bored with that kind of meditation rather than uh, becoming enamored with how much really there is happening all the time. And that we begin to learn to just watch the show. What's going on in our environment? And so we started paying attention to what the eyes can see and what the ears can hear and what the touch of the cloth and just go around with all the senses. And when we're eating food, we really pay attention to the food. And when we're asleep or when we're laying down, we really pay attention to the posture that we're in. Make sure that it's a comfortable posture, generally on our on the side. Then on a hard floor, a hard surface, it's better to sleep on the side. And Thai people, they do it naturally. But there are the, those in the West who have never taught how to sleep, so they have a backache because they're sleeping on their back. And so their answer is, buy a mattress, a big, fluffy, expensive mattress. They advertise them for that. Oh, you got backache? Come buy our mattress. The truth is, oh, you got backache? Sleep on your side on whatever mattress you've got. So <laughs> this is the whole cultural thing that we can look at that has that advantage to it of looking at what we're doing. Right now, you don't need a mattress because the back hurts. The back hurts because you're not laying properly. If I had laid properly, the back wouldn't hurt. End of story. Got that wire. Whoop de do. I didn't even have to buy a new mattress. Didn't need one anyway. So, bringing that back to the meditation, if we, um, there is actually more happening than I was thinking of, like, or was aware of. So, if we could kind of uh, uh, widen the field of of awareness a bit and see what else is going on, then there would be more to to find, uh, to observe. And I would probably get uh, more clarity and interest back in it again. Is that, uh, am I getting that right? Is that yes, and it, that's exactly right. That one of the things that happen with people with meditation is they think that it's a closing down. And then when we get things really closed down and tight, it gets really boring and old, <laughs> especially all of the power that it takes to keep things like that. And the real practice is to learn to open up, to be here now and experience all there is that's happening right now. And there's many examples of that that's very interesting. One is the whole idea of the Zen stick. Why does the Zen master go around hitting some students and what students does he hit and why? The answer is, is that if a student is daydreaming and off in outer space or he is actually deep in meditation in an inner space, in either case, he's going to get whacked. The students who are here now and know that they're here now when they know that they're here now because they know that the uh, um, the meditation master is right behind him with the stick and they're going to sit up just enough to let him know that they know that he's there and that they're aware that he's there and everything is okay. I also remember it was not a game in the sense of a trick or anything like that, but it was in the sense of the way that Achan Po taught. had to do because his english wasn't very good he it got better over time but with me he did a lot of stuff that that uh that taught me the dhamma in a way 
that didn't need language. One of the things that he would do is he would stand in the front yard outside my cootie and wait for me to find out that he was there. Which meant that I needed to be aware of my surroundings. And he taught me that. And see, all I can do is just hassle you with it in words. But it also was reminiscent of something that happened when I was a teenager, because I was, um, let us say that I had a good friend, and the two of us together made the only motorcycle club in northern South Carolina, <laughs> in the motorcycle gang we were. <laughs> and he taught me many things, including two things that I remember the best, because they're really Dhamma, and that is, is that you can only go as fast as you can see how far ahead. The further ahead you can see, the faster you can go. But if you see a current or a bend or something like that, you can't see in front of you. Or if there's a big truck or whatever it is, you can't go as fast as you want to because you can't see where you're going. That was one of the most important lessons. But another lesson that he taught me was you got to see the cops before they see you. If you can see the cops before they can see you, <laughs> then you're okay. All right. And so I tell you that because it's kind of a joke, except that if you can see the Duca before it sees you, you're okay. So keep your lookout for cops, whatever that cop may be. That's keep a good phrase. <laughs> yeah. Make sure you see the dukkha before it sees you, because if the dukkha sees you, then it's completed the cycle of Paticca Samapada. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. So. <laughs> so that's a really good phrase to use, is to be on alert. Wakey, wakey, watch that stuff coming so that you can get out of the way, because in fact, if you're very good at it, you can see it, make that determination, oh, I don't want to be struck by that arrow, and then step out of the way. Just like any good high speed martial artist would, or the ones who really want to show off will just merely catch the arc before it hits them. <laughs> but it's better to dodge because you can do that easier. <laughs> but you got to see that stuff in, in, in flight. Can't wait until you get hit. And if you do get hit, then you got to get it out rather than worrying about where it came from, because you already missed that. Trick is now that we're hit, we got to get it out. So if the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune of somebody insults you and you get hit, you got to get that out right away. But if you're really fast, ah, it missed me. Whoever you were criticizing, that's not me. <laughs> that's not who I am. I don't do that kind of stuff. <laughs> not just innocent, Your Honor, be happily innocent. <laughs> so this is all at the start by practicing doing this just with every thought that comes up, any thought that you can remember to investigate, do so. And that'll get you on a roll so that when really heavy duty things ever happen, you can handle them. And in the meantime, life's a joy. If you can remember to weigh those dangers, to step aside. And funny that this whole thing that we're talking about is nothing but the Eightfold to Noble Path of the Buddha. Is to wake up, take a look, make an evaluation, and then take the right effort to make a change in attitude. Practice I was going to say mm -hmm. Go the ahead. evaluation 
it, it kind of rotates on on where you have to make more a bit effort as well. Like some people might have to make more effort on evaluation because they haven't got that down. Like they might it might not see, they might not see the weight of the things yet. Some people might not be able good at like looking at the thing at first. I feel like it, it switches, right? There's there's a balance of things of how hard for me. Like I now see that I was not evaluating enough. Like I was evaluating, but I was not putting the danger as dangerous. I was putting, oh, it's danger. I, I can handle it, but mm -hmm. not dangerous. Oh, dangerous. I better watch out. I better step out. Okay. Now the way that this is described in the suttas is the situation of if these three things run in circle around one another. Running and circling around one another is sati and investigation and right effort. So that they actually improve one another. So that the more often you wake up. And investigate the more often you wake up, the easier investigation is going to be. The better your investigation is, then the better your right effort is going to be until the right effort in the beginning is a, a effort. But later you get on a roll and then it's not so much effort. And in fact, you could even go so far as to call it energetic. That is just this is the new natural way to do it in the old way. It was trying to get the thing rolling. But now that it gets rolling, it will be hard to reverse to go back to the old ways. But this is way too much better. And so you're not about to go back unless something big event happens, like you get busted or something. But then that's just another opportunity to practice, like getting um, sick. It's just a good opportunity to practice. You don't have to feel bad because the body's sick. You can say, hey, I can handle being sick here. <laughs> yes, Robert, good to see you. You got your hand up. But your microphone is muted. OK, so what <laughs> if what if we don't feel like worthy of happiness? Like there's this thing I've been running into lately where I feel when I become happy, I feel like almost ashamed to be happy. Like it's like I'm like I'm like I've cheated on a test or I've broken the rules. Uh, like you I'm, have I'm guilty exactly. for something. Yeah. You are guilty. Yes, you are. Ha ha ha. You have broken the rules. Where did you learn those rules? Who told you that you got to up two, three, four almost so long before you can be happy? Somebody told you that it's part of the culture. Mm, mm. Yeah, Western society. Yeah, part of Western society. Congratulations, you're screwed up. <laughs> Just like everybody else. <laughs> because you feel guilty about feeling good. I mean, how screwed up can that be? Yeah, it's uh, it's it's quite bad. It's quite bad. <laughs> yeah, it got to, right. it got to the point where I was like, this is such a simple instruction, and I know this instruction. I've been practicing this for months. How? how why can I still not just um, not just calm down and relax? Yeah. That's sort of when I came to the realization that you know I, I just I wasn't left to myself. You know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there is something that we can borrow from psychology. And this is uh, a psychologist who was in the tradition of transactional analysis. And that what she was saying was that she had her own three P's. And that is permission, protection, and potency. Okay, that's the power. And that the power is generally given by the therapist so that the client then knows for sure themselves that they have the power to change. That that's what psychotherapy is really all about, is about change. The question is, can you change? So you have to have the power to. But then the, the second P is the one that you're looking at, and that is the issue of do you need to have permission? Do you need to have permission to have the power to change? Yes. 
Okay, who, I don't need my permission. Yeah. Who, who, whose permission do you need? Like my permission, I guess. Oh, well, I don't think that that counts, does it? I mean, who are you to give you permission to do anything? That's like the judge having permission to be his own judge, right? Okay. That's a good point. That's very, that's, yeah, that's a very good point. Okay. So this is where I'm coming from on that one. And that is, is that you do have my permission for you to go ahead and feel good, all the good you want to feel without having to feel guilty or think that that's dangerous at all. But you can actually deeply look at the fact and see that, in fact, feeling good is not dangerous. Feeling bad is dangerous. Feeling good is not dangerous. And you have my permission to look at that deeply so you can figure it out for yourself. Because you don't need um, uh, to give yourself permission. What you need is to do the investigation and you need the permission to do that. And so I give you my permission to go deeply into to figure out that feeling good is not dangerous at all. Then you can really explore it with freedom. Marcus, does he have your permission? Thank you, Marcus. Here, here's the question. Absolutely. Why, yeah. Why is it that uh, in some like Western interpretations of Buddhism or meditation, like people are so afraid of feeling good part? I've, I've run in, into that a couple of times where people are like, oh, you're feeling good when you're meditating, then you must be doing something wrong. Where where does this where did this start? Can you can you explain that? Like that some people have this very hard or very, I don't know. Uh, Actually, you're, you're touching on one of one of my favorite joyous subjects. About where did it all go wrong? And that that generally can be traced back to the uh, the late 400 AD. In the fifth uh, in the fifth century AD is when uh, most of that uh, let us say the final death blow, but we can also see that things got really injured at about 280, 260 BC, that period of time, because that was the time of the third council. And that was the time because of Asok being the emperor, making Buddhism a state religion. He gave free food and free housing and uh, the, the, the um, uh, let us say the requisites for the monks to anybody who wanted to become a monk, and they became monks way too many because they were ordaining each other and they didn't have really good teachers. So you can imagine that it was something like a major university that's got 5,000 students and it's got a faculty and staff of about 500, that all of a sudden on the next year, they have 50,000 students on campus. But no place for the well, they did have housing for the 50,000, but they didn't have the classroom instructors for that many without really, really watering it down. So that was a major event. That was part of what happens. And people, when they come to the teaching of the Buddha, they come to it from a position of they already know what it's like. So they look at it the way that they've been looking at things from the from before. And so we bring our own prejudices and our beliefs into it. And when so many people do that for so long, it looks like that this is Buddhism, where in fact it's not Buddhism at all. <laughs> then it's not according to the teachings of the Buddha. So there's a lot of stuff that's been packed in over the years. And I would say that one of the major problems with uh, it most recently in the past, let us say, four or five hundred years is Western Buddhism has not been given the whole complete package of the triple gem of Buddham, Saranam, Gachami, Dhammam, Saranam, Gachami, and Sangam, Saranam, Gachami. They still have Sangha in Thailand. They still have good monks who really understand the Dhamma in Thailand. They still have uh, the Dhamma correctly understood in Thailand. The Triple Gem exists in Thailand, but it doesn't exist in Western Buddhism. 
Now, I'm not saying that the entire culture is completely triple gem to the suit, but uh, it's at least it exists and it exists um, quite frequently. And so uh, it's actually requires all three. And that part of that means that the, you have to have a community to where people are helpful for each other to grow because they're good friends with each other, teaching each other to be friends with each other because they're teaching each other to be friends with themselves on the inside also. Which is basically what we're talking about here is to get rid of all of the unwholesome thoughts about our own failures and our own rules and not being able to live up to the rules or being able to break the rules like having joy without earning it. That's one of the rules. And so you need permission to come out of that rule, but you have to see your way throughout it. So this is the whole point about Stila Bhatta Paramasa is our attachments to all the way that things should be that prevent us from being naturally who we really are, which could be quite joyous and happy and satisfied and productive in whatever way that we see fit to be productive or not. Our choice. In other words, take control of your life. Become that, uh, as the, the Buddha said, become the driver of your own life. Rather rely upon something in the back seat giving you directions. You're not a taxi cab driver. You're, <laughs> you're the Formula One racer yourself. <laughs> Stop listening to your own backseat driver. Wow, that's a real, I hadn't thought of that before. Does that make sense to you, Robert? Stop listening to your own backseat driver. You're not a taxi cab. Yeah, you're a Ferrari. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, um, that's actually really good advice. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great analogy for it. That sort of like negative commentary in the back of my mind, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I have a question that when I'm uh, conducting this investigation and I'm, I'm trying to find out that um, uh, joy isn't dangerous, but um, do you have any um, tips and like pointers for investigating? Investigating just means looking and seeing, doesn't it? It's just looking. Just, so, just, okay, looking with the idea um, the way that a nurturing parent would look in on her child at night before you go to sleep. Okay, you're just looking in, making sure everything's okay. And if there is bedlam going on in that room, you just step right into it <laughs> to calm the situation down. That's what we do in the mind. Can you remember to check in on yourself? See, everything's okay. Everything is fine. Oh, uh, what the <laughs> heck is going on here? <laughs> Which is the unwholesome thoughts. And one of the unwholesome thought is, in a way, it's like the elder sibling is picking on the younger one, the younger sibling, by telling her what to do. And that the younger sibling is rebelling. To the older sister. OK, that's basically how our, our mind is working and what we need is an adult to come into the room. So the elder sister is the one who has all of the rules. Or the elder brother is the bully. And he makes the rules, OK? And then the younger child, which would be then the reptilian brain or the uh, uh, more primitive part of the mind would, would be referred to as the child ego state, rebels against that bully. And round and round we go in our mind, telling ourselves to do this and then rebelling against it. I don't want to do it. Okay? Very familiar with the, yeah, the way that goes, the pendulum swings back and forth. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Yeah, well, yeah. 
and and that's the the exact thing that you had is is that you want to feel good and something tells you I, I, you can't do that how dare you feel good without my permission <laughs> I, I get like resentful i'll feel good but it'll be like like um like tarnished with this 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 sort of ill will and this sort of this pridefulness like look at me i can't feel good like you know uh-huh. Yeah. Like man and 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 back to whatever authority figure there is in the backseat driver. Like, hey, I can drive this car any place I want to, but you're still in a having a fight with the backseat driver. Mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I can still hear that voice in the back of my mind and everything. It's not yeah, it's not like yeah. It's not like there's no real like unification going on. Ah, right. So now we have to start recognizing that no, we can actually have a kinder, more nourishing backseat driver for ourselves. That you can, in fact, replace that passenger. Your choice. If you're going to be a taxi driver, at least get better passengers. Mm. At least have a different set of rules or guidance to go by. And so we can experiment with that. Like having new set of standards, something that's better than the old set of standards. Including nurturing, having nurturing thoughts rather than critical thoughts. If we can remember time after time after time, keep remembering what kind of uh, backseat dr <laughs> passenger do we have? Do we have a backseat driver or do we have a uh, nurturing uh, parent He's like mama trying to serve sandwiches over the <laughs> over the seats. So that's the question. Are you going to start giving yourself these nourishing sandwiches like permission? Can you give yourself permission to turn that around? Before I was saying you can't give yourself permission, and ha ha, you can <laughs> if you know how. <laughs> Can you, in fact, change that driver's uh, attitude and give yourself permission that everything is okay and you can feel good? And then that third one is um, protection. Because the protection then is, is that there is not going to be any, any danger or adverse results to the fact that you can change, that it's all for the better. Mm, protection, all right, mm -hmm. right. Is that like um, protecting the, sec the seclusion? Right, right. Like we, get, we get protection, every, right. So that's also that quality of everything is going to be okay. I have that protection. And that protection comes from, again, attitude the attitude is your protection right right and you're secure really secure well protected yeah and i don't it's, it's see this thing. sorry Robert. i don't know if you can see this like happiness is like counterculture like every every music nowadays is about being sad and struggling look how hard i work for my money look how sad i am but being happiness is the real like counterculture like most people think they're like oh i'm not part of the culture look i'm struggling i, I don't deserve to be happy but the real <laughs> counterculture is being happy yeah it's just being happy anyway yeah, well, yeah. actually, we could go so far as to say, yes, you do have culture and counterculture. Let them have at it. We're above both of them. We're above it all. Not part of culture or counterculture. I was in counterculture for a long time, and I'm no longer in it. I'm, I'm above that. <laughs> I am not on the, the side of the stage that is the counterculture. You know, Shakespeare has the line, everyone, uh, everyone is an actor and all the world is the stage. Well, guess what? Some of the actors are reading the script of culture and the others are reading the new script of counterculture and they're yakking like heck at each other. 
And when you can wake up to the fact that you've got both of those dialogues going inside your head, you can just go sit down in the audience and just watch the show. <laughs> You're talking about spiritual community is the counterculture. <laughs> Yeah, well, they'll counter each other at every chance they get. That's true. That's true. I feel like like spiritual communities totally focus on the differences between each other far more than the similarities. Mm -hmm. Spiritual theater. It, yes, that's the spiritual the theater. With, along with the spiritual materialism. And the real release is to being friends with everyone which would exactly be following the teachings of Jesus, which is do unto others the way that you want to be treated. If you treated people the way that you wanted to be treated, now there's some technicalities with that, but basically treating other people more or less the way that you want to be treated. So that if you want to win, then you treat each other, uh, other people like they're winners, like they can do it too. Rather than black losers, oh, I can do it, but you can't, <laughs> is now a challenge instead. And, and so it has to do with the attitude of being a winner, so much of a winner, that you can see everybody can be a winner too. Everybody's a winner. Because they can change their attitude about it. They don't have to feel like losers. They can feel like winners. If the Buddha can do it, if Socrates could do it, if JC himself can do it before they nailed him up, then you can do it too. You're a son of God. Or if you're really up to it, you're God himself. Your choice. <laughs> yeah, I have a bit of resistance to that one. But you're God <laughs> himself. Like there's some I, I, that that feels like like it's 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 like it's kind of yeah. Like it's, it's it's wrong to be that happy, you know. Or, <laughs> Is God happy in your mind? <laughs> I mean, I I assume so. <laughs> if God was happy before He met you, why is He more happy now? In other words, what difference do you make? God don't yeah. need you. Right. Is he happy without you? If he was happy yeah. before he got you, then he's happy without you now. Is that right? So he does not need you for him to be happy. So why do you need him for you to be happy? That's actually that makes a lot that makes a lot more sense now you've explained it. Yeah, that actually makes sense. Yeah. I suppose yeah. it's just that you're it's, as I, good as he is. <laughs> I think it must just be. I think it must just be like cultural conditioning. Like I've just been conditioned to to see certain things as uh, like like uh, wrong, right? Like just too much. You know, I, you know I, I'm just a man. I'm not allowed to compare myself to God or 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 put myself in the same sort of level as as like as like um, uh, you know a saint or. In some has. places, it's called heresy, and it could be dangerous to say that. Yeah, yeah. And the, the, I feel like even though it's, you know, it's, it's not so, like, um, it's not t treated so seriously nowadays. Just, I think, like, the remnants of that is still, is still like, prominent, you know. Right. So, in uh, fact, what you're, what you're talking about is an old taboo that's rotting quickly. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The, the the idea of like original sin, even like I feel like I'm not even a Christian, but I definitely, I definitely feel like that that sense that like my my default like something is, is broken yeah. inside and it can't be fixed. Exactly. Exactly. But yeah. you can find a doctor who will charge you to well, comfort exactly. you. <laughs> like I need I need to do something, or uh, I need to do something for someone else or for society in order to. To be worthy of feeling happy, I can't just feel happy for the sake of being happy, even though that makes me a nicer person, and I've witnessed that myself many times. <laughs> I know. Maybe if you made more money, you would be happier. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Here we go. Next one. <laughs> yes, these are all of those rules that we've given uh, 
since childhood standards. A to B to C. Right, and they have to be able to see these things, to recognize that this is just a set of rules, a set of standards, a set of criteria, and that now in your life as an adult, you can set your own rules, set your own standards. And we have a suggestion. And that is, we only really need one rule, just one, just one little rule. And we just keep applying that same rule over and over and over and over and over again. And what does that one rule do? Dukkha? Dukkha Naroda. Take the easy way out. Don't take the hard way out. Take the easy way out right here, right now. Yeah, it's the, it's one, it's the one step method to happiness. It's not the 12 step program. It's the one step method. It's a one step program. Exactly. <laughs> and that's the whole teaching of the Buddha, but it's it's lost in translation with all of these words. One of the words that is misunderstood is the word samati, which is translated often as concentration, which we're not doing a concentration. We're an opening it up, not a closing down. We're not removing ingredients one after another until we get down to the essence of it. We already accept that there's no essence there, that the chariotness is not in the wheels of the chariot. Mm, mm, mm. And so we stop looking for the, the for the essence of it, and and so we give up on concentration, and we start looking for now uh, missing ingredients for a really wholesome meal. Ooh, ooh. Okay, and so the ingredients are be free from the hindrances of the mind, free from unwholesome thoughts, being able to apply the mind on the wholesome, sustain it on the wholesome, gladden the mind so that we um, are free from um, insecurities. We feel safe, secure, comfortable, satisfied, and then successful. And that's the little thing that you call first jhana. That's the pity and the sukha. What is the pity? Feeling safe, secure, comfortable, satisfied, and then successful is the pity, the crown. And we practice that over and over and over again until we really, really get into how good can this feel. That's the first jhana. And we keep looking at it over and over again, keep refining it, keep pushing it, keep, you know, joyfully playing with it as a new toy, the mind. Yeah, lately I feel like sort of like, um, you know, like a, some sort of missile targeting system. You, you, you have this, this, this object in mind, the pity, and you're just like focusing and, and uh, inclining to focus, 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 and the mind's going like this at first, and eventually it sort of settles down and it gets more focused, yeah. Yes, that's exactly the way of looking at it, is, is that um, by by continuing to reevaluate, uh, in computers there is a thing called a binary search, where you've got all of the alpha, all of the people that you're looking for in alphabetical order according to the name. And the computer is you're going to give it a half and half. So it goes half into this group and it's either you got the guy or his name is less than this group or it's greater than that group. And so you decide, oh, well, he's got his name has got to be down in that group. So now I'm, my next look is only half of that. And I either got the guy's name or he belongs in either this part or that part. This is called a binary search, and that means that we just hone right into it until we, if we've got two names and the name we're looking for is not, is not between them, then he doesn't, he's not there. Ooh. And so this is a binary search, and it, it's a, um, it's primitive because it uses only the basics of the computer. So this is one of the first um, algorithms that was developed for computers, binary search. But that's exactly what guidance systems do in those trajectory of rockets, but it's exactly how the human mind works too. If we would continue to narrow in on it and keep focusing in. But what we do is we narrow, we focus and say, oh, it's that, and then we quit because that's the easy way out. 
we say, well, at least I know that it's in that half. <laughs> mm. Mm. Rather than continuing to focus down to where we really get uh, an understanding. So it's a reiterative process. Over and over and over again, we keep uh, searching down into it by looking and investigating each thought as they occur. Mm. One thought as they occur, and then you begin to see patterns emerge. And it's good that, in fact, many people would have gone a long time without recognizing that they feel guilty about feeling good. Yeah, I certainly so you, did. Yeah, so now that you've figured that out, let's do something about it so that you're not plagued with that anymore. Now you can feel good about feeling good. And you can feel guilty about feeling guilty. That'll get you out of that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why should you feel guilty? You don't need to feel guilty. What a terrible thing to do. You ought to feel really guilty about doing such a terrible thing as feeling guilty. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know if this... Sorry? Relates, but for the longest time I had this feeling where I, I, I cannot smile in public, maybe I cannot smile in public, I cannot be smiling in public, you have to maintain like a poker face, you're a serious man, you know? <laughs> At one time I also, when I was a teenager, I had gotten the misconception that it is absolutely wrong and forbidden, and it would bring on terrible consequences if I ever congratulated anyone or gave them a compliment. That it was such a terrible thing. I don't know what it was, but maybe some of you guys have had that, that, there, that you were absolutely resistant to giving anybody any benefit at all. Mm -hmm. Any congratulations. Yes. And even receiving it yourself, it becomes hard as well. If somebody exactly. compliments you, you're like, oh, oh. Mm -hmm. So look at how we are now broken on both ends of that, that neither will we congratulate nor will we allow congratulations, to where in fact congratulations is actually very beneficial. It's very wholesome to give people benefit for what they've done, to congratulate them, to let's give people awards verbal awards and so i make sure that i do that when a student comes and says that they've done something correct i'm saying you got it you got to do it like that you got that one wired yes so learn to congratulate yourself to nourish yourself like that over and over and over again keep congratulating yourself robert you've got it made you deserve it. You got all the permission you need and all the power. And all the protection that you need. To just allow yourself to feel good. Getting a sense of well-being. Everything is OK. You got it wired. You got it made. You're a made man. Who made you? You did. Thank you, Damarato. Um, I have a I have a question, um, about practicing in in a in a formal sitting context. So what we're doing is meditating. We're a bit more serious about it than as you know if we're just going about the day. Um, so in my that formal setting, do what we've been talking about since you called. That's what you do in that formal setting. You just sit there and figure out what you're doing to keep yourself from feeling really good while you're sitting on the floor. Yes, yeah, yeah. Some sometimes I'll um and this is a habit that I've had for a while and I've noticed sometimes this will come up with where I'll get myself into a very satisfied state like the first jhana for example and it'll sort of have its own it'll like maintain itself I won't really need to do anything to maintain it anymore so it'll be after like I don't know, like maybe and it'll minutes. fall apart. It will. It will well, fall apart if you say that I've got it. I've got it completely wired. No, you have to keep pushing. You have to keep coming. That's the sustained part of the mind. 
Now, if you've been suing for first jhana for, let us say, 100,000 hours, then the pushing is so much easier now that you wouldn't push, call it pushing at all. But yeah, yeah, yeah. this is kind of new for you, and that's the real reason why the Buddha put that point about applying the mind and then sustaining it and keep sustaining it and keep sustaining it because the old stuff is going to pop right back in if you let it. And so your your first jhana has become short-lived. So the question is, how can we make them longer and longer is by keeping ourselves on card to make sure that this thought is wholesome and this thought is wholesome and that thought is wholesome by basically by having thoughts about what's happening right here in our environment. So even as you said for a meal, you're not going to let the mind wander. You're going to keep the mind focused on the food that you're eating. Yes, what I'll do a lot of the time uh, is um, I'll, uh, it'll have its own momentum and I'll sort of focus on other things. I'll switch my meditation object. I'll start to doing other stuff, right? And um, yeah, yeah, eventually it'll, it'll end, just like you said. Yeah. My question was going to be like, do I keep just, well, I mean, you already answered it. It's like, do I keep? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I guess that's. Yeah, there's fun. really not much to the practice. There's always, you know, the questioning mind is, oh, there's got to be more to it. There's got to be more to it. And the answer to that is, yeah, the more to it is recognizing that you want more to it. Yeah. And that's the whole point is stop wanting and just relax. Everything's already okay. You got that's it. exactly it. That's exactly it. That's exactly what I do is it's like I feel satisfied. And it's like in order to get there, I had to sort of suppress like certain like desires but then after i'm there like the desires come back and it feels like it's in like kind of a wholesome way and so i'll let myself like pursue the desires to meditate in other ways and then like they'll kind of lead me to crashing and burning and having to go back to step one again and it's yeah yeah it's ah, like, it's, so before like, you crash and burn when did level. you lose control of your aircraft Or when did you lose control of your chariot that was being driven by mindfulness? And I stopped, huh? um, or, or I stopped practicing Anapanasati and started doing other things. All right, now you got it. Exactly yeah. so. That's the sustaining of the practice. And we can think of sustaining in the sense of moment by moment. Or we can think of it in the sense of hour, or even day by day, or even month by month. But we have to keep sustaining the practice because if we forget altogether and quit altogether or go off and do something else that we call meditation, while we're not really watching where we're going, then we're going to crash land into that. But if we go mm -hmm. off and practice some other meditation that requires us to watch what we're doing and keep, an, keep the being the driver of your own life moment by moment to watch where you're going, Pay attention to the road that you're on, the road of life, and you won't wind up in the ditch. That's it. That's the whole thing. And then you, you're really exhilarated about, look how fast we can go and how good this feels, but you got to keep watching. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you uh, stop uh, watching just to experience how good it feels, you're cruising for a bruiser. Yeah, I'd like yeah. to make an input here. Um, yes. If you're reading a lot of material, Robert, you, your mind might go to that material when, when you get comfortable. It's like, I've got to try that out now. You know, if you've been reading about yeah. different techniques and such, um, but Anapanasati is like the whole technique. You don't really need anything else. Yeah. Well, there's not, it. there really isn't anything else. Other than something that's unhealthy. usually all other techniques. Well, I found that other techniques make sense once you're in a relaxed state of mind. But the first step is always an apanasati. Like what, oh, that's, other that's techniques what it, come from relaxed it, yeah. state, but they don't tell that's you how to get relaxed. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. Yeah, yeah. Like I'll do the other technique, and then eventually, like I'll lose my relaxation because I stop sort of giving it as much attention. But the, but yeah, I, I don't. It, it, it's like the the desire to. To do that kind of comes up once I'm already relaxed. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So 
these things that you put in great big quotation, other techniques, my position is have at them. Just watch what you're doing. Watch where you're going. Pay close attention what the mind is doing. And it doesn't matter what technique you've got because it fits right in anyway. I mean, that's what the whole quality of Zen and the art of archery or Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance or whatever Zen and the art of this, that, and the other thing is all about watching what you're doing. I especially like the Zen and the art of archery because that's all about form and doing it correctly rather than where the arrow goes. That so long as he's dragging the bow up like this while he's getting the arrow, he can lodge the arrow while the bow is in the air and bring it down like this. And then he can let it go. The arrow is launched. He could care less where the arrow goes. But Westerners, they're all interested. Did he get it right? Did he hit the target? Where's that arrow going? Let's watch it in the air. While the Zen archer has lost three, launched three more arrows. Because he's got the form down correctly, and so he can speed it up. Just like very, very high uh, technical, uh, difficult classical music can be learned by repetition over and over again, doing it slowly, and then with correct fingering, you can build up the speed. If your fingering is not correct, and when you build up the speed, you can't do it correctly. You've got to have the right fingering. That's some, that was a really important lesson at one time for me. The, the correct fingering is the, is the only way to go. But once you got the, uh, the correct fingering, which means watching every step that you make, even if it's fingers on the piano, is watching where you're going. Continue to watch exactly the way that you're doing it, and then you can get that speeded up. Mm -hmm. So that's the way that we're practicing here is we're practicing watching these thoughts and watching these thoughts, and then we can begin to go uh, full speed. That is exactly how katas are learned in uh, karate. Do you know what a kata is, those forms? Mm -hmm. Another one is Tai Chi. What is Tai Chi? It's merely a slowed down kata. That's amazing, isn't it? That all of the martial arts is done by doing it very, very slowly and then speeding it up. And that's exactly what we're going to be practicing with Anapanasati too. Getting ourselves secluded, getting ourselves quiet, and then we start watching the content of the mind, and pretty soon we start bringing that up to where we can see the mind in operation at its full speed. You can see, oh, yeah, I see that. <laughs> hmm. But we have to start slow with where we get. Another way of talking about it is, is that as we understand Paticca Samampada in the sense of cause effect of how the mind operates, but how we discover it is in reverse order. That we start with the dukkha. We start after we've hit crash landed. We start with uh, the, the dangers of it. And then we start working ourselves backward into actually seeing the way that the mind itself works. And the faster we get, the quicker we can see the order of occurrences as they arise. Hmm. I'm Damarasa, I have a I have a question um, about diagnosing the fourth, um, the fourth jhana. Don't. No, develop the first jhana. Get really good and satisfied with being in the first jhana. And you, then you'll just, you know, like uh, not crash, but land in the fourth jhana. Just naturally, it happens automatically. You've got to get the first jhana completely correct. And how you do that is by every thought that you have about wanting fourth jhana. You can say, oh, I don't need fourth jhana right now. I can be okay right here, right now. Let me pay attention to what we're doing. Wanting fourth jhana is going to crash land you out of first jhana into dukkha. I want something I can't have. True, true. Very, but very if you true. can get first jhana and get it sustained and get it sustained so that absolutely for sure one holds some thought after another, after another, after another, is when we begin to put gaps in there. Hmm. Take it from there. 
but let's go for that. Let's get some gaps between those wholesome thoughts, making sure that the next thought that comes up, no matter how much of a gap, is going to be wholesome. It's not going to be crash landing. We're not going to go to sleep when we're up there in the air. We're going to stay awake. We're going to watch what's going on. That's the whole point of the first jhana, is to stay awake, to sustain that staying awake. That's the trick, to sustain staying awake. Wakey, 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 wakey. Mm. Mm. Yeah, my... Um... I wanted to say bye, guys. Sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, my phone is dying, so I'm gonna head out, guys. Thank you for well, this time. Bye. Yes. Nice to see you. Actually, Robert, this is a good time for us to finish the talk because uh, I think that we've gotten something of value for everyone out of it. But there's no end to the questions. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so. Go practice what you know to practice, and that is, is to get yourself into a good state and sustain that good state, knowing that that itself will create the foundation for something quite marvelous to happen. That you don't need to keep climbing some ladder. Arrive already. Get situated is a way of saying it. Settle in <laughs> to the first jhana. Okay, guys, well, uh, this has been a really great call. I really have enjoyed it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate um, um, Marcus, your, your input. You've always got some Dhamma there for us. You too, Tamarato, and everybody. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yep. And your name is uh, Anjuska. Uh, Ariosha. Ariosha. Thank you for joining us. I hope that you can uh, uh, call me some uh, time and we can uh, talk together. Oh yeah, I'd be glad to do so. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll shoot you an email then, I guess. No, no, you can just call me right on uh, Skype. All right, all right, I see. Cool. Yeah. yeah. See you, Alicia. Bye. See you, Robert, and see you, Happy Giorgio. Sunday, right? Guys. Yeah. Bye. 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 Okay. Bye, guys. See you. Okay. Bye, bye, guys.